Okay, I'd like to, it's being at four o'clock, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Zoom webinar. The webinar is being recorded and so you will be able to view it later on our website if you uh, if you like to see it again or if you have colleagues who may have missed it. Um, if you have questions at the end, being a Zoom webinar, you can place them in the Q&A and then I will uh, read them out um, for answering at the end. I'd like to welcome everyone to the inaugural lecture for what will be the Institute for Precision Medicine's monthly seminar series. Uh, with the rapid progress in precision medicine, our goal is to highlight key areas, both locally and nationally, internationally, um, focusing on the opportunities and then also the challenges in precision medicine. And I'm happy today to introduce our inaugural speaker, Dr. Anantha Shaker, Senior Vice Chancellor for the Health Sciences and the John and Gertrude Peterson Dean School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Shaker is a nationally recognized educator, researcher, and entrepreneur who has major contributions in medicine and life sciences. He has many outstanding accomplishments in precision medicine specifically and personalized care, many coming from his former role as director of the Indiana University Precision Health Initiative. Dr. Shaker gave a great TEDx talk on precision medicine about five years ago. You can find that if you Google it. Um, and if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. He talks about precision medicine and, and what we hope to see. And some of that has actually come to fruition. And much of what he speaks in that TEDx talk is re still relevant today around genomics and, and the role of genomics. Uh, precision medicine is causing a disruption to nearly every aspect of medicine, um, including its teaching, including its research, and then including its delivery. In his talk, Dr. Shaker will discuss the academic medical centers and the path forward for re-engineering our medical system, ensure that we provide the best possible care for our patients. Dr. Shaker, thank you, and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thanks everyone for uh, this opportunity to um, talk about some uh, broad and um, big ideas for our field. Um, and while this is a, a precision medicine lecture series, and I will touch on some of the concepts of precision medicine, I think this is also a, I would say, a, a, a new era for academic medical centers in general. And I think with the advent of precision medicine, with the advent of uh, finally the human um, genome becoming actionable, um, we are in an era when all of medicine, uh, in terms of our clinical practice, in terms of our clinical teaching, and certainly, of course, our research, are all changing uh, dramatically and at very rapid pace. Uh, it also provides a, a, a great deal of opportunities for us, and at the same time, it raises a lot of uh, external pressures that that are going to disrupt uh, the academic medical centers as we know it. So that's part of my uh, uh, question mark here. It's like, if we are going to be thinking of academic medicine in the future, we do have to conceive, uh, conceptualize uh, a new model that, that will, uh, for, for lack of anything better, uh, more attractive name, I'll, I'm just gonna call it uh, AMC 2.0. So the current academic medical centers or what we might call AMC 1.0 have traditionally been the great engines of innovation. They've, they've been the sources of great discoveries, the sources of great deal of knowledge. But um, the challenge of translating that knowledge to real practical solutions has been a big gap and a big pro, uh, challenge for all of us and a big problem for all of us. And this was particularly, I think, demonstrated starkly during COVID-19. As you saw, a lot of the work in, that came out and a lot of the solutions that came out for COVID-19, whether it's the vaccine or the drugs, were all built on academic discoveries, were all built on academic, um, initial academic ideas. But to be able to scale up um, our, from a discovery or from a laboratory uh, concept to a product that, that has to be um, not only approved, but then manufactured and distributed to hundreds of millions of people is 
not something that we as an academic medical centers can do. It takes a huge amount of uh, um, innovation in terms of number of other areas, especially uh, industry, manufacturing, scale up uh, uh, FDA approval process, et cetera. So I, I think this, this is the underlying theme of a lot of the disruption that's going to happen in the academic medical centers, but also in our research environment. So I'd like to start with that, um, that our current academic medical centers have traditionally been the epicenters of healthcare and engines of innovation, but this is going to be disrupted and they're under multiple pressures, um, multiple pressures, some positive, but a lot of them uh, are, are a negative in that sense. So we need to think about how we're gonna to pivot to get to an a AMC 2.0 and how that in turn would help us not only become more competitive in the new world, but also do uh, better work and greater amount of discoveries and greater amount of products uh, that are going to help our patients. We have been traditionally um, tied to what we would you know, often call as our tripartite mission. Oddly enough, even with all of our century old traditions, this tripartite mission is still somewhat overlapping, but still three different silos. Um, we have the traditional clinical mission that is still driven in clinical uh, specialties and clinical sub subspecialties, uh, clinical department structures with very, um, I would say, fragmented care of patients. And almost all of it is still focused predominantly on acute care and management of non-chronic conditions. Majority of the chronic conditions are left to be managed by the patients themselves in various types of uh, um, you know, specialties and subspecialties. And there's still no good tradition of a primary care quarterback concept for our clinical care. Beyond that, a lot of our clinical care is um, overlapping, but not always uh, clearly and seamlessly integrated with our research mission and our research findings and our discoveries taking a discovery in the research realm in this uh, middle silo to the clinical uh, realm currently still takes about 14 years. And that's really extraordinary just to think that with all of the things, uh, all of the innovations and all of the other industries can take this, uh, their ideas to, um, to real people um, faster than we can possibly imagine in medicine. Um, so COVID was one of those examples where that 14 year typical um, uh, sort of translational gap was actually reduced to 14 months. And that's extraordinary. And that's obviously because of a huge pandemic and a various uh, regulatory uh, relaxations, but theoretically we should be thinking of a world where we can do that routine. Education, on the other hand, you can see is, is even more of a silo. And there's, there's a whole host of educational challenges that we uh, have not addressed. There's, it's, it's been very traditional, predominantly focused on providing um, sort of education for uh, clinical role preparation. And beyond that, there's not been a whole lot of depth into uh, actually understanding the concepts of prevention, understanding the concepts of uh, uh, a, a personalized care or even uh, tailored uh, approaches to uh, patient uh, uh, problems. So this is a, um, uh, an, unfortunately, the current state of affairs. Um, but what is even worse is that a lot of this tripartite mission is expanding very rapidly by external forces. Patients and external disruptors are demanding a lot more from our clinical, um, clinical practices. 
And beyond that, there is a lot of challenges of community uh, needs and community engagement, prevention, and other types of uh, uh, clinical venues for providing care. And all of the all of those forces are really putting a lot of expectations and pressure on our clinical environment and our clinical infrastructure. So that's that's going to continue. And add to this now that we are beginning to understand that uh, outcomes are really determined by a number of non-biological factors, a number of even genetic uh, subclassifications. Um, it makes really the standard uh, sort of our clinical approach to diagnosis and standardized treatment um, much more challenging. So that's really where precision medicine is going to disrupt uh, from internally how we practice clinically. And then the external disruptors will be societal expectations, community expectations, patient expectations, as well as uh, many non-traditional disruptors like Apple and Google coming into healthcare. Research, again, has been traditionally focused on obtaining research grants, research publications, generating knowledge, and putting that knowledge out into the, um, I, I would say, the, the general societal uh, forum to be somehow translated uh, through a variety of uh, um, either industry processes or rarely from an academic side itself. Uh, but that's, again, an unsustainable model. If we simply focus, as I will talk about it a little later, simply focus on uh, current funding of, uh, of biomedical research that is not uh, going to be adequate to our future challenges, nor is it going to keep up with all of the needs of uh, solving our, our uh, uh, health problems in the society. And education, again, is, is going to be disrupted in a number of ways. Uh, it's, you know, it's going to be uh, expected to include um, various uh, curricular approaches that are going to be much more individualized, will be in, informed by a number of structural um, sort of disparities and discriminations that have been traditionally part of medicine. And there's, of course, uh, always new technologies, new challenges, new techniques, new skills that uh, uh, that students will have to have. And physicians will be managing larger um, sort of data management and data analytics and decision support and IT tools. All of those will have to be new skills that we will have to teach uh, our, our providers uh, of the future. So, you can see these expectations are expanding. Our, our thoughts and ideas, the best practices are expanding. And all of these are going to strain our sustainability. So we really have to think about various ways of both um, you know, harmonizing these three missions, but also thinking about new ways to um, support some of these uh, later demands. Unfortunately, the academic 1.0 operates in a very traditional, I'd say slow uh, is a kind word you could say, uh, is very traditional healthcare cycle. You can imagine how this goes, you know, it's pretty, we all know this, you know, there's a lot of basic research, fundamental research, biomedical research, uh, disease-focused research, translational research, are all being done in large academic medical centers and some in industry. But all of that results in potential discoveries that could be a, a, a treatment or a solution or a product. But then there's the whole host of clinical research that needs to happen. And these are have to be synthesized into a therapeutic agent with a therapeutic strategy that has to be then uh, undergoing phase one, two, and three trials. And then of course, for the FDA, traditionally the randomized clinical trials, which are very slow and expensive, 
and generally done in pristine patient populations with very low diversity, almost always uh, um, minimal diversity of uh, patient population, uh, and almost never reflecting the patients that we all, you know, we might see every day in our clinics, uh, are then uh, approved. And then once the approved treatments are available, um, there's a whole host of um, challenges putting that into clinical care. Uh, there's the pricing issue, there's the general penetration and acceptance of, uh, of these drugs by providers and patients. And then once that happens, uh, of course, the data is collected haphazardly. So phase four and, and general market research and uh, population level uh, findings of these treatments are uh, completely random at this point, and there's no systematic uh, assessment of efficacy, effectiveness, or uh, you know cost effectiveness of any of these treatments. Um, and then, of course, we start thinking about health outcomes and surveillance. Um, as I said, there's no systematic approach to this. End results are really almost more marketing than any science-based approach. And then we are back to this cycle. And most of the time, currently, there is something that's discovered here, takes 12 years to get approved, and then another 14 years before it becomes a standard of practice everywhere. So this slow cycle cannot be sustainable and is not going to solve any of our future problems. Add to this, the fragmented role of uh, academic medical centers in this healthcare account, you know, healthcare process. In this cycle, there are huge ownership barriers. You can see the this quadrant of this cycle is, uh, you know, primarily led by medical uh, research in, uh, institutions and health sciences schools, some industry, but. Almost all of this space, you know, taking the once you have a potential product idea to an approved product, is essentially um, biotech and pharma industry, which has very different structures, very different economic incentives, and various types of um, you know challenges there. Once something is approved, that's when you get into the hospital systems and healthcare systems which of course have their own various barriers that we have to um, work through. And then finally, you have the payers uh, who actually um, will determine how much of that penetrates into population, how much do we actually collect data from the population, what value do you extract, what value do you optimize. Uh, so you can see this cycle, while it's not only is it 30 years old, 30 uh, year long, but it's really fragmented in terms of whose incentives are being pushed at what stage of the uh, innovation. So this fragmented role uh, of AMCs in the healthcare economy makes us essentially relatively ineffective change agents. And we need to think differently about that. Financial scales, again, are completely uh, against really value-based, research-driven, facts-driven, and value uh, and uh, uh, evidence-driven care. You can see the scale of health economy. Our total health economy is about $3.8 trillion at this point in the US. And this is broadly how it's distributed, our total Hell, uh, R and D budget for the academic medical centers and health sciences schools and various other um, not-for-profit R and D agents is about sixty billion dollars. Compare that to the biotech and pharma industry and how much research and, and R and D budgets they're putting in. It's about you know two times more, two x more. And almost all of this is product and market driven. And then the large portion of our budget then goes to the hospitals and healthcare systems. That's about 1.1 trillion in 2019. And then the remaining part goes to 
uh, non-hospital care through CMS, uh, providers, costs, physician practices, pharma industry, insurance company overheads, and many other miscellaneous things. So you can see where the money is and where the power base is and where the influence is in, in trying to transform our uh, academic medicine. And unless we begin to, um, in some way, uh, leverage the, our connections and our, our opportunities in, uh, in these two lower quadrants, we're not going to be able to change the way we approach academic medicine, way academic medicine can lead uh, our future um, of, of our society. So that's, that's really part of the challenge here. So what do we wanna do in Pittsburgh um, if we imagine ourselves as a academic medical center? And in, in the Pittsburgh AMC 2.0 is, you know, the idea is that we should be one of the world's best places for integrated clinical care, research and education innovations. So, and, and implementation. So in, in other words, we need to, as best as possible, remove those tripartite silos and create a value-driven and economically sound um, care model and discovery model and, and product development model. And that would position Pitt and UPMC to be world leaders. We are, you know, we are huge. We are already big and we are world, leader, world leaders in those four quadrants, um, but we are just as siloed in those four quadrants as the rest of the world. And we have the opportunity to connect those quadrants um, because we're really, uh, when it comes down to it, one single family with one value that we all espouse, which is, bringing uh, uh, best solutions. And what do we aspire to do? Our scientists want to develop solutions, cures and products to treat and prevent diseases, uh, rare disease, common disease. We want to find solutions. That's, that's our collective goal. And uh, yes, we sort of haggle with, um, with the research side, with the clinical side and the uh, insurance side, but that's, that's uh, that's really what I would say an internal squabble as opposed to the big picture and what we really should be uh, standing up for as an organization, as a family enterprise. UPMC and Pitt Health Sciences schools can create new models of healthcare by dis a integrating discovery and implementation into routine clinical care. Because that's, that's really the holy grail for us to achieve here. And we can do that. I think even more excitingly, Pitt and UPMC can develop this, essentially what I call a virtuous close loop, academia, industry partners, providers, and insurers into a closed loop system of producing first in class healthcare and healthcare products. <clears throat> and then of course, you know, given that we have so much uh, educational uh, sort of footprint here in all of the health sciences. Uh, we should definitely be um, the world leaders in interprofessional education and uh, forcing and workforce development for our health systems. So that's what we aspire to. So really, if we aspire, truly aspire to do this, then we ourselves are our worst enemy by being you know, uh, siloed in our four quadrants. And that is where the opportunity lies for us. What, what can we do in education? And I think this is one where we, uh, it's of course our core mission as a, uh, as a health uh, university, health sciences campus. Our education should be of course, thinking about the, uh, developing future workforce. And this, you know, again, is changing rapidly. Education is becoming more individualized. You don't give the same lecture and the same textbook and then expect all students to just learn it, uh, you know, by one single mechanism. 
Uh, also, there's a lot of individual skills, individual levels of learning patterns, and we need to maximize that. We need to have our education be patient-centered and not um, subject-centered or specialty-centered. Uh, we need to become digitally intensive because that's how it's going to be utilized. There's no one needs to have all of the pharmacology knowledge in their head. They can easily uh, reference the pharmacopoeia in their hand with through a smartphone. So they have to be able to be much more savvy with uh, tools and decision support. And all care will all be given in interdisciplinary teams. So education should reflect that. So we do need to think about interdisciplinary teams. So one of the big ch challenges for AMC 2.0, especially if, uh, if we want to do build that here, will be our, uh, our educational mission. And that's where we will have to transform a lot of our uh, educational approaches to both digital and immersive learning approaches. Uh, these could involve all the way from virtual reality to novel curriculum approaches. But one of the interesting things about this is that this actually will reduce the pressure on some of our current challenges. Um, a lot of the virtual and immersive learning, the technology is so good these days, we can in fact reduce the pressures on some of our clinical rotation bottlenecks um, by doing ma many things before they get to the clinic. We can, for example, also uh, enhance equity and accessibility to a lot of our educational um, you know, degrees and activities. And interestingly, we could actually look at this as a revenue generator for sustainability and further investment in education. So this is going to be a, a big initiative that will open up over the next uh, uh, several years, but uh, areas like precision medicine will be uh, core to really changing our, our curriculum. So patient-centered precision approaches with a team-based um, uh, technologies is, is really going to be the mantra going forward with, uh, with education. And, and we just need to uh, start building those platforms and building that infrastructure and uh, creating the next generation of educators who are savvy with many of these. Uh, technologies. But I won't touch too much on education at this point, um, but in, the, in terms of uh, clinical care and, cl and research, we have to marry clinical care and discovery research much more intensively and much more intentionally. It has to be integrated. It has to be patient-centered, of course. You know, even research will need to become increasingly more patient-centered. That doesn't mean that we, we're not going to value fundamental research and fundamental discoveries. But the, the fact that we have to uh, create greater volume of uh, funding and greater volume of resources to do this fundamental research. And as I showed you earlier, the big buckets where the money is, is really not in uh, biomedical uh, funding but it's really in creating a, a funding mechanism back from potential clinical uh, revenues and clinical improvements. And that's really part of the reason why a greater integration is also good for fundamental research, not just for patient care or uh, patient solutions. And of course, clinical care will become increasingly more personalized and precision driven. All of care will also become, um, will be judged by the true outcomes, health outcomes and health value that uh, treatments or uh, our clinical care will provide. And increasingly, and this is where I think UPMC and, and PIT can excel, is that our clinical care becomes, sorry, um, increasingly uh, informed by a commercial intent or a product or an economic driver on top of the quality and uh, patient outcomes and, and patient satisfaction. So that, that adds a further um, uh, potential sustainability model for them. But all to make all of this work well, 
we have to create a system that seamlessly goes bi-directionally from bench to bedside, bedside to population, population to bedside, or population to bench. So, uh, and, and we have the capability to do that here, um, but we need to build the right kind of infrastructure, right incentives, and the right um, uh, pathways to do that. So this is really the, the key principles that we will be thinking about in clinical care. How, how will this you know, move the fields forward, uh, all of our three missions forward? Here's one example I will talk about, and this is again, uh, recently published um, uh, paper. Uh, and it's really looking at cardiovascular diseases and cardiology. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, uh, research uh, opportunities here, you can see we, we have several cardiac, you know, most people think cardiovascular diseases are all uh, pretty much, uh, we have treatments for all of them uh, and they, you know, we have incredible uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, solutions, including heart transplant, et cetera. But still, uh, even today, the cardiovascular diseases are the number one uh, cause of death. And there are many cardiovascular diseases that become chronic diseases with no good treatments or no effective treatments. But we are not able to um, move that field forward beyond where we are now because of what I would say lack of precision uh, and the lack of uh, stratification of these chronic diseases, these large chronic diseases like resi treatment resistant hypertension, like treatment resistant congestive heart failure, uh, strokes and atherosclerosis. All of these are the big pillars, um, yet we we think we have treatments for most of those. We do for majority, but there's still a significant number who don't respond or who respond uh, inadequately. So we need to genetically stratify these patients, phenotypically stratify these patients, and then do extra, you know, truly uh, deep and complex omics to unravel the mechanisms of why they're drug resistant, why they're uh, maybe we are not. Uh, addressing the right targets or the right pathways or the right mechanisms in these subsets. And that leads to a significant sort of questions which can be brought back into the lab, whether it's preclinical models, man, new mechanisms that we haven't fully addressed, the new uh, bioinformatics based modeling uh, and uh, uh, big data based uh, discovery process. All of that can be driven through these very specific clinical questions that, that have to be defined first properly, uh, rather than just say, go find a new pathway for congestive heart failure. Um, and then of course, again, the other opportunity for us then is to bring it back into our clinical system and create novel ways of approving and uh, discovering, novel ways of uh, uh, creating approval pathways and showing the efficacy. So COVID, again, was a great example of what can be done if we uh, integrate research into care of patients who are falling sick with a disease. So acute COVID management uh, cre you know, created approval of uh, five drugs within a, less than a year. Um, of course, the vaccine story is well known to all of you, but that's really what we need to do. So EMC 2.0 must integrate discovery and clinical practice towards better solutions, towards better models of both doing research, but also getting products approved. But the current process of doing that, again, is extraordinarily complicated. You can imagine uh, any of you who have uh, discovered something and are trying to take it into a product or have taken it into a product, know this cycle very well. It's an old, uh, relatively clunky cycle. It's, you know, the, your lab does fantastic work and you find a new target, you find a new product idea and you 
say, I have an invention, aha. And then you go to the tech transfer office and say, I'm making a disclosure. And then the disclosure gets evaluated by various people, including the tech transfer office, maybe some additional stakeholders, and then they decide to patent you or not patent you. Then the IP protection issues uh, dominate the conversation at that point. And then you have to, uh, even if you had IP protection, you have to market it to somebody who's going to develop it, who's going to pick it up and begin to think about investing money in it. And then, of course, there's the whole wrangling about licensing and well, who is going to pick it up, how are they going to move it forward. That is just the beginning of the whole journey towards a product development, which is an art and science and uh, in an economic sort of uh, lesson in all, all in one uh, by itself. And then, of course, eventually it needs to get approved and become a a, a public asset to everyone with uh, disease. So this is the typical cycle, and it is one of the most painful cycles in the current environment to go through, anyone who has uh, gone through it or is going through it. Why is it so painful? Well, it's part, one part is unfortunately the drivers of this, this whole cycle of moving discoveries into products and patient impact are fragmented with multiple owners, divergent incentives. So you can imagine, you know, uh, the research R&D part, research and development is, is sort of driven by school strategies, department strategies, PI strategies, and each of them is doing their own thing. And none of them are, you know, specifically saying we're gonna go for a product X. They're all doing their research and, you know, with various incentives of their own. And, and sometimes, you know, this, uh, this sort of uh, thousand flowers blooming will come up with a good invention. And that invention essentially happens in a PI's lab. And it's really up to the PI to recognize that invention, to think about what is possible with that invention, and then reach out to someone to say, I think I have an invention. And once you once a PI does that, uh, of course, not not many PIs are trained to do that, and most PIs aren't thinking about it. Um, even if they were, uh, they then have to talk to their peers who might evaluate this. Uh, they might talk to the tech transfer office, but some some person then says, "Yes, your invention looks interesting. We should just uh, uh, file a patent." Uh, and that's completely driven by the tech transfer office. And they often have their own priorities, have their own li resource limitations. And then once they file a patent, it's sort of generally left to them to go sell it to a developer or a, uh, or, or a entrepreneur who's gonna then take it uh, to a product pathway. Uh, but that marketing into a product idea is not done by anyone at this point. It's often by a PI or, or a unusually savvy tech transfer officer. But majority of the time, we file a patent and it sits without a lot of activity. And of course, once you do finally get somebody to pick it up, it's completely dominated by the for-profit pharma industry who have their own incentives and who you know, as much as we know, they want to help people, uh, they have very different economic models, very different kinds of market forces, stock pro, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, prices, et cetera, that they have to watch. So you can imagine this whole process, the ownership of this process is so fragmented with so many different, um, you know, lack of uh, uh, consistency. I won't even go into this slide, but uh, um, uh, other than uh, talk about it at high level, I'm happy to share this with anyone. This is a paper in itself, but the barriers for taking discoveries into products and patient impact are you know, very well documented, very well known and numerous at each of these stages. So for example, with R&D, we, we don't, you know, we might say, 
yes, uh, Pitt Med, for example, has uh, $480 million of federal funding for research, but really it's not an R&D shelf in the traditional sense. It's not, there, there's lots of research that are happening, but almost all of that is driven by uh, intense competition for grants, the slow and conservative peer review process, and of course, a lot of uh, academic incentives that aren't actually asking you to uh, find solutions, but really find uh, papers and uh, find various other types of academic metrics, none of which I'm discounting, but it's not, uh, it's not driving what I would call a solution-based approach. Um, and not that all research has to do that, but certain part of that has to happen for this cycle to work. Um, but even after that, they, you can see with each of these stages, IP protection, for example, tech transfer offices have limited resources. They don't have ability to maintain, uh, you know, hundreds of patents. Uh, at some point they'll say, well, I, I, I don't have the money to patent it. You have to pick up the patent cost, et cetera. Uh, and that becomes a big barrier. They often hire IP law firms who have no connections to a product strategy so they may file an IP, but that may not be comprehensive, that may not be effective, that may not even be uh, a good filing in many times. And we are almost always outflanked by patent trolls who can work around our patents and really just bypass us completely. So that's just one example of how at every stage we have significant challenges and we need to be able to um, become more savvy, become more um, engaged and create pathways as a system. Um, some of this works well, for example, with some companies that are working with UPMC Enterprises because they have put a lot of these in place. Uh, but that's not, that's not what I would say is system level um, uh, resource that's available to our researchers. And that needs to happen for us to be much more impactful. So what is our uh, strategy going forward? Well, UPMC, PET, AMC 2.0 strategy is really to create this virtuous loop, uh, loop with extensive uh, partnerships with seamless uh, translational circle. We, we have best in class R&D, federal R&D funding with UPIT, but we need to also create a subset of that that becomes intentionally commercial um, or product uh, facing or patient solution facing, which is you know one example of what we might uh, enhance with new recruitments or new centers and new investments. The second asset we have is best in class health system, UPMC. It is a huge health system, largest in the country, extraordinarily uh, effective in delivering care, um, but it needs uh, significant work to become a leader in taking clinical discoveries and evidence that is generated from patients to implementation. So there's a lot of uh, effort to do that and uh, a new office and a new position is created with uh, Dr. Derek Angus leading that. And there's going to be a lot of work, the ex exciting work that can be done here both to improve patient care and patient outcomes, but also to discover new things and new ways of uh, helping people. We also have a best-in-class health insurance. Uh, so you can see that the bottom two quadrants that I spoke about, we already own big chunks of that here. And we just need to connect them better and seamlessly connect them to our discovery and uh, biotech process. So uh, what we need the health insurance to become is a closed loop value sponsor. So in other words, if Derek's group comes up with a fantastic way of managing patients, the health plan needs to incentivize uh, implementing that into larger and larger population. If uh, Jean Kunichali's group comes up with a fantastic product to cure or treat a particular disease, or uh, Mark Schlante comes up with a T cell therapy for a particular disease, or Adrian comes up with a fantastic diagnostic uh, for a cancer, 
we need to be able to have our health insurance be the first to approve payments for that and to say, we are a closed loop value sponsor and a purchaser of our, uh, of our innovations because that will set the market rates and that will set our efficacy uh, data and effectiveness data in populations, which then will bring Medicare to the table and then other insurance will start to pay for it. So we should use our health plan as a way to enter the market and, and begin to change the conversations in the market rather than once again, wait for the 14 years of translation time to happen. Finally, one of the gaps that is not uh, well covered in Pittsburgh area is to uh, create a biotech and product development industry. Uh, we need to attract that. We need to build that ourselves. Uh, some of it we'll have to build ourselves. Some of it we'll have to attract as we start creating valuable products here and value chain here with our clinical system. So we need to create that biotech economy, attract uh, uh, new ways of uh, doing business here. But that is the um, initiatives that are gathering steam as well now. So what I hope in, in five to seven years is that we will create this virtuous loop here, even if it's in two or three big areas of medicine and start to demonstrate that this is the, um, uh, the way that Academic Medical Center 2.0 can not only change the economic model of academic medicine, medical centers, which is really the small benefit of this, the larger benefit of that is that we will have transformed healthcare as we know it. And that's really the, the big audacious goal that we should be going after. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, that I hope, uh, while this is at a you know, 30,000 foot level, it gives you a sense of where we, we should be going, how precision medicine and precision health and really uh, our integrated uh, virtuous loop approach will, will truly make a transformative change. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. And I told Adrian, I'll give plenty of time for questions. So I'll yes. stop sharing my screen and uh, open up for any comments and questions. Thank you again for your attention. Yeah, that was great, Adantha. Thank you very much. Uh, normally there would be some round of applause, but I guess I, I guess I can do it personally. But there are already several questions in the box. Maybe I can just take, I can take the privilege of having the first one. On a subject you only touched on lightly on education. So one thing you pointed out with COVID is the rate of information exchange has gone, you know, sky high, yeah? It's, it's hard to keep up with it. And that's been both good. So for example, the release of the sequence allowed for vaccines and bad because obviously things like hydrochloroquine got used as a therapy, yeah? So how do, the how do you think, and obviously you're gonna ask your medical educators in the School of Medicine to deal with this, but what's your opinion on how you deal with this rate of change? You can't write a new curriculum every year. So how, with this incredible knowledge we have about precision medicine, how's that gonna be integrated? How do you see that being integrated each year as new knowledge comes on? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it is going to be a, a paradigm shift for us. And I think the paradigm shift that we have to think through and really develop is that a lot of the learning has to be self-driven. And the idea of a, uh, you know, a completely, uh, I would say, fully informed teacher disseminating information to a student is simply not practical in this explosion of knowledge that's happening all the time. So, I mean, just take uh, you or me as an example, supposing you were giving a, you know, uh, a precision medicine, uh, you know, course or even a, a subset of class lectures to the medical students, um, let's say you know, to the second years or something like that. Your, your classes are scheduled uh, from January, the, you know, the first three weeks of January of each year. Well, you can't wait 12 months to up, up, update the, the knowledge of the students 
that are now never going to see you again for it throughout their medical school. So how are you going to be able to reach the third years and the fourth years and the, who are already done with your course and will never come back to you? So that's the kind of stuff that we'll have to think through. It's like pharmacology, I mean, it, it, you know, anatomy may be the one that doesn't change a whole lot, uh, but every other field changes every three months. So you're not going to be able to say, well, what I taught them in 2021 will be the same in 2024 by the time they graduate. Um, so how do we do that? And how do we create a, a self-driven kind of competent, uh, competency that is constantly you know, updated um, without they having to go and review the PubMed every week or something? Yeah. So, and, and the only way to do that is through novel technologies, uh, virtual learning, you know, constant updates and, and continued sort of uh, uh, reinforcement through other mechanisms. Um, okay, so there's quite a few questions coming in. So from Alejandro Munoz Valencia, thanks for a great presentation. I would like to ask what could be the role of equity in the new 2.0 strategy? Does the need for commercialization compete with access to health products and services? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the equity part is what is driving a lot of the disruption because of the, uh, the lack of uh, access, lack of quality care, uh, sometimes even structural racism are really hurting our outcomes, hurting the implementation of our solutions. Uh, vaccines is a great example. We know we have a great solution but we're not able to really effectively deliver that. Um, that's one example, but it's the same for cardiovascular diseases. So they don't have access. It's the same for diabetes care. Um, why do we still have such poor uh, you know, infant mortality numbers? All of these have to do with uh, lack of access, lack of technology, lack of utilization of new ways of doing medicine, uh, clinical care or research. Uh, the drugs that are being approved. They're all done on very select patients, lack of diversity in clinical trials. I mean, all of those are drivers of uh, AMC 1.0 that makes us uh, increasingly less competitive and increasingly marginalized. Yeah. So the next question I think you'll like, it's about IP. So some centers, academic centers have mo moved to allow more IP control by investors and try to remove the hurdles, some of those hurdles you placed on your, on your diagram. They also give financial support and incubator resources without requesting full IP rights. Is this a direction you envision? And I guess, timeline. Yes, um, it is a direction I completely envision. Uh, it's also uh, going to break some of the modes and models of academic tech transfer. Um, again, it's, uh, as you can imagine, like any tradition that you're trying to break, there's going to be a tremendous amount of resistance and naysayers. Uh, but that's, if we are going to, as I showed in that cycle, if we are going to eliminate that bear, all of those barriers, we can't uh, start off, uh, you know, holding everybody, not even getting off of uh, first base. So, you know, we, we just have to get people uh, free. And the other thing that we in biotech we know is that the original IP never ever becomes a product. The original IP goes through so many transformations as it's approaching its commercialization pathway that it's silly to imagine that an IP that we file today at the university is already ready to become a billion dollar drug. Um, so that's again, another fallacy is that somehow, uh, so all I, I say, my, my position is I don't need to sit on a lot of IP, I would rather have the revenue. So the next question is an interesting one. It's a pretty high level one. So you laid out the plan for AMC 2.0. What's happening with UPMC 2.0 and Health Plan 2.0 and Pittsburgh Biotech 2.0? Well, I guess the question is what's your role in making sure those things are aligned? We are completely aligned. In fact, uh, I 
I know I shouldn't say this in publicly, but I have full endorsement of uh, Mr. Romoff and UPMC in this concept. So this is not something I'm just dreaming up by myself. This is this is where we need to go as a as an organization for all of us to really change the world. So from David Feingold, an interesting education question. We benefit from the multiple schools from students coming into public health. Do you envision develop some common cause of training for all the schools of the health related sciences and trying to break down those silos which you talked about? Absolutely. I, I see most education in the health sciences happening in teams. By teams, I don't mean teams of medical students. I mean teams of medical students with the nursing students, with the dentists and with the pharmacists and, and uh, respiratory therapists. So that's the team I'm thinking of uh, as opposed to, you know, six medical students forming a team. So it's an area that I'm very interested in from Shandong Wu. So how do you see artificial intelligence data science will impact medicine in general and specifically in education to medical students and clinical trainees? This is something you mentioned digitally intensive What's your yes. vision for that? Because that's is really transforming medicine. Yes. Yeah, so again, I I, uh, I don't want to say things before I have discussed with the teams in my in my uh, curriculum group. But one of the things I imagine within the next two years that every medical student gets a, a course in AI and machine learning. Um, so it, because that is going to be part of medical practice. Um, and I'm sure it will become part of healthcare in general um, because you, you need to be able to understand how your decision support systems work, how you, where you use it, how effectively can you use machine learning algorithm based solutions, recommendations. So it's not just about getting a tweet on your smartphone and saying you should give this patient the drug X and you either ignoring it or taking that advice. It's really understanding what that uh, whole process is. So uh, it's, it's no different than them understanding the Krebs cycle in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, I guess that's a good analogy. From George Mokolopoulos, an interesting question. There's often a conflict of intellectual interest between needing to publish first to get recognized as, as faculty and then compromising the intellectual property, particularly now in this era of bioarchive and social media and everything getting put online immediately uh, and the risk of losing intellectual property, what do you, how do you balance those? How do you think you balance those? Because in your model, you have this movement to a part of it being IP, but how do you balance that with the, the academic mission? Yeah, well, part of it, I think, you know, as I said, it's in that evaluation phase, recognition of where you have an invention versus where you, an invention idea or a germ of an invention and where you don't have it. And the idea of uh, filing a disclosure uh, is, is not onerous once you recognize that you have a potential idea for an invention. And once you file the disclosure, publication is not that difficult. I mean, you know, I think the idea is you don't have to wait till your patent is granted or even uh, till your patent is filed before you can publish. The idea of recognizing that invention disclosing it and somebody formally recording it into a, a provisional filing is all you need. After that, you're free to publish. So it, it's not that onerous. It can be done in three days if you're in an urgent need. It's just that we never have a system that's savvy enough to do it and facile enough to be accessed. So Michelle Baum has an interesting question, which I'll ask, and then I think I will also paraphrase it because I'm interested in the answer. So she asks, do you have a sense that AMCs around the country are moving in this direction as well? And I guess my paraphrasing would be, which one do you think is the closest to that and which one would you like to mirror? I think the only one I would mirror is the National Health Service in the UK. There is nothing in the US. Oh, I like that answer. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing in the US that comes close to what we're talking about. Because even if they have fantastic research, I mean, Hopkins is a great example. Fantastic research, right? Fantastic hospital system. They have no insurance problem. So you can't determine the market rates. You can't drive penetration into the market. So there's, whereas National Health Service can't, 
They control the R&D funding. They control the clinical care. They control the market. You know, the NIS uh, group controls the purchasing of the product. That's where you can make a difference. So the only thing that I would say comes anywhere close to it, and that's why they've done so well in COVID yeah. um, in, in UK, uh, developing all these products and vaccines, et cetera. Um, and, and that's really what, what I would say is our closest competition. So it's one minute to five. So I'll ask the last question, which is gets back to precision medicine, which is a, a more philosophical. So do you think precision medicine is gonna reduce overall healthcare costs to the public? And if so, when do you think that's gonna happen? Because clearly the more sequencing we do and the more tests, it's getting kind of expensive to, to comprehensively examine a person's you know, genome and epigenome and exposome. And do, when, how do you see that enabling value? Yeah, I, and, and this is where, I, and, and that's an absolutely brilliant question. And uh, the reason I, I think that is a, a, a question we have to answer right now before we get too far down this path is because the current model of precision medicine is totally driven by rare diseases, totally driven by genetic mutation driven diseases that are you know, small numbers, high cost and very effective cures, which is great now, and nothing against that. But to truly make this a sustainable um, model that reduces healthcare costs is when we start addressing chronic disease. That's where all the cost is. Most of the cost drivers are heart disease, diabetes, metabolic dis uh, syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, in, and other neurodegenerative diseases. The chronic diseases is where the big cost items are. It's not a million dollar treatment for a rare genetic disease that is given to 200 kids. That is not driving our healthcare costs. What is driving our healthcare costs is all the ineffective outcomes and chronic morbidity and mortality that we are paying for. Um, and that's where we have to seriously think, and the only people who can do that at scale is, is systems like UPMC or the National Health Service, because we have large enough number of these patients to actually study. Yeah, fantastic, that's a great ending. And so I appreciate you, Dr. Shaker, you taking the time out of your busy day to give the lecture and answer the questions. We didn't get to all of the questions, there's quite a lot of them in the box. So I will make sure for those that are listening and didn't get their questions answered, that those are copied and sent to Dr. Shaker and he can think about them in his, when he's uh, put them under his pillow or something. Yeah. No, no, happy to, happy to sort of uh, create a line of questions and answers and we can even continue this conversation as this is not going to be, you know, one once and done kind of activity. So this is our next seven year journey. So we, there'll be a lot of things. To oh, we, we will have you back next year to hear what the, the, the solutions are. Okay, thanks everyone. I appreciate everyone dialing in. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye-bye.